Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to episode 40 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe. With me, as always, we have Jordan, we have James, and we have a lot to talk about here as the Ben McAdoo era has begun. Last time we talked, it was the day before, I believe, the Giants announced Ben McAdoo would be the coach, and we had a press conference, and now we've had a few days to kind of digest on, on what Ben McAdoo is going to be and his, and his scheme and um, the staff coming in here. So we'll talk all things new Giants coach, all things Ben McAdoo. Uh, Jordan, we'll start with you. And up, McAdoo, Joe? how you doing, buddy? How, what's your first impressions here of Ben the coach, Ben at the podium, Ben staff, everything? First impressions of Ben McAdoo as a head coach. Yeah, well, let's first get to this. I, mean, you, I think we talked last time. The last question you asked was, we, would we have a new coach before or after we talked? And I think I said after the next time we talked. Not quite, not quite on that one. The, the process moved a lot quicker than we thought it was going to. Probably, actually, not probably, but definitely pressed by the Eagles' interest in McAdoo. So we got a new coach. We have Ben McAdoo, not a completely new name or new face or new voice because he was already the Giants' offensive coordinator. So, uh, but I, I look when I did my list of you know who I thought should you know out of, out of the known candidates last time we spoke. Out of the known candidates who the Giants should hire, number one on the top of my list was Ben McAdoo. Uh, I wasn't sure if he was. I actually, do, actually don't think he was the favorite at that time. But he ends up getting a job. Uh, the fact that the, the Eagles were interested pushed them. And you saw what Ben McAdoo is about. I mean, he's a serious guy. He's all business. Uh, very organized, hardworking, blue-collar. Everything we knew about him beforehand, he's a Western PA kind of guy. You saw this at the press conference. You saw this afterwards. You saw this with his ideas. You saw this with all his, you know, mottos and sayings, you know, evolution, not revolution. And uh, but what was what was the other one, James? Uh, uh, about, la- about lazy people? I, I think it was, uh, you know, like, what was this like? Determined dedication what, or dedication is what la- you know, lazy people. Obsession. Yeah. Obsession is what lazy, you know, lazy people say about dedication. Something like that. Dedication. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you know, that's what Ben McAdoo is all about. And uh, I think it's good. I mean, it's a good hire. I think he's a, a bright young coach, 30 years old, but carries himself way, you know, as a way more authoritarian figure. If I just made up a word there, excuse me. That's what we do on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I consistently, I, that seems to be a common trend these last couple of weeks. I just continue to make up words. I'm just going to go along with it from now on and pretend like, you know, I'm saying real words. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I like the Ben McAdoo hiring. And I, I was worried if I had my druthers, the only thing I would say was I would rather him have not come back with Steve Spagnola. And not, nothing to do even – you could debate whether Spagnola is a great coach or a really good coach or a bad coach or whatever. But just for the fact of having – enough change uh you know the idea was to create a change here to create a different environment i think it would have been beneficial to have not have the same per- people running the offense and defense but he saved himself by making sure that he shook up the staff enough where there will be changes significant changes significant new voices significant tone and and some new fresh ideas by basically not bringing back i don't know half his staff half the staff of tom coughlin uh, the the strength and conditioning coach is out as well, so that's another significant change the Giants will have. So I I, lo- I like where they're headed right now. And now let's see what Ben McAdoo's got. We will. And the actual quote, the exact quote, just so we have um, Ben right here, is obsessed is a word the lazy used to describe the dedicated. Which I, I like that quote. And that right. was, I'm a big fan of that quote too. I think yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. I do too, and I I think that's a good one for McAdoo to. To kind of get started on. James, what was your big takeaway this first week or so? Uh, we're doing this podcast on a Wednesday afternoon. First week or so with Ben McAdoo as the man in charge of the Giants. You know, my big takeaway was, I, I know his, his suit didn't fit, but it <laughs> seems like the job fits him. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people wondering, okay, is Ben McAdoo, you know, as an offensive coordinator for the Giants, he's had some interaction with the media, but, you know, it's only been, you know, what, like, eight, ten-minute Q&As once a week. Um, he hasn't really been front and center. He's a guy from western Pennsylvania, small town. How is he going to handle, you know, you know, I think someone said, like, the New- if you're the head coach of the New York Giants, that, that's a big responsibility. Um, you know, I, I talked to his former boss, Walt Harris, the pit coach. He said, you know, 
that's kind of the folklore of the NFL, you know, the Giants. And um, I think people naturally wondered, okay, how's this guy going to handle all this? And uh, I think he's handled it splendidly so far. Um, you know, he's been, as Jordan said, he's serious. Uh, he seems to have a you know good temperament. He's had some he's been humorous at times, kind of a kind of a dry wit that I I think people say, hey, you know, Ben's kind of a funny guy. Um, he seemed confident. I think he's been very respectful of Tom Coughlin, but at the same time making it very clear that I'm he's not Tom Coughlin. He's his own person, and there are going to be changes going forward. Um, so I think so far, I mean, look, it, it's really early on, and uh, you know, eventually we're going to have to ask him about injuries and everything, and I'm sure that will kind of change the dynamic. But uh, so far, I think he's really handled himself well, and he seems like he's you know he's fit to be the head coach of the Giants, which is something I think people were kind of wondering about. Yeah, I know you, you brought up the suit, James. Anyone besides me sick of hearing about the suit? Or yes, I mean, very tired of the suit. I mean, what was about the suit? I mean, it's not 1952 anymore. I mean, he's not going to wear the suit on the sideline. <laughs> and I kind of felt bad for him because I, a few years ago, lost weight. And I, I know what that, because I have a suit that's still too big for me <laughs> now. And I've had, at times had to wear it because I just, my other one that fits me wasn't clean. And I, I know that feeling where you look ridiculous in a big suit, but like, what's the guy supposed to do? He lost weight. Good for him. That's a good thing. Well, oh, you, could, yeah. you could always just get a new suit, Joe. I mean, it's not that yeah. hard. No, and especially him. I guess it's worse for Ben because, you know, Ben's got enough money to go get yeah, as yeah, many yeah. suits as he wants. You, would you think. don't want to blow all your savings on, on a suit. I get it. You got, you got a kid to feed. Right. But, uh, but, you know, ben, no, ben I could afford a suit. I'm sure ben, ben is going to get plenty of suits now, I'm sure. Uh, I believe there's a line of tailors outside the Quest Diagnostic Center right now. So. Oh, I'm sure there are. Now, Jordan, you mentioned a couple of things I think we could expound on in your first, um, you know, your first things you were saying here in this episode. One being last week, it seemed like the Eagles interest and really definitely the Eagles interest in McAdoo probably sped this thing up. Do, and does any part of you believe it changed the process for the Giants or it just sped it up? Like, do you think Ben McAdoo would be the head coach now, even if the Eagles did not have interest in him? Oh, man, that's a tough question. I think it would have been a completely different scenario. First of all, if Hugh Jackson didn't take that Cleveland job, he would have been coming in that Wednesday to interview with the Giants. Uh, actually, he would have, yeah, he would have had to interview Wednesday. It was scheduled for Thursday morning. So they weren't going to rush past that and push anything with McAdoo, probably, if they were waiting to speak to Hugh Jackson because he was a serious candidate for the job. So. You know, it really pushed it. And when they found out, the Giants found out, okay, they, they called Ben, I think his representatives, and they said, well, you know, he's, they said, can, we, can he come back in Thursday, meaning for a second interview to talk? And uh, they said, well, he already has something scheduled with the Eagles on Thursday. So they said, okay, they, well, let's get him in today, this afternoon. This is Wednesday morning. And uh, look, Steve Tisch said the end of the week, John Mara wasn't even sure if that was possible. This was Tuesday night. So the fact that they hired their head coach on Wednesday morning just shows the drastic shift in the line of thinking at that point. They weren't ready to hire him or close to hiring him on Tuesday night. All of a sudden, the Eagles get involved. They have to push it. They don't want to lose him to the Eagles, and all of a sudden, he gets hired on Wednesday, basically Wednesday night. Comes official on Thursday. Right, and that that gave the Giants, you know, their coach, and maybe a quicker pace than we thought they might land. Like we talked about last week, James, what did you think about the Eagles' interest, and and do you think it really truly affected who the Giants' coach was going to be, or just the just the timeline of it? You know, obviously, Joe, I, I tend to think that when this when this whole thing started, I thought Ben McAdoo was was going to, you know, when when Tom stepped down, I thought that Ben would probably, if I, you know, I told people. Gun to my head, I'll, I'll say Ben McAdoo on January 4th is going to be the head coach. Um, that definitely changed during the process when it seemed, you know, guys like you know Doug Marone kind of rose up, and then there was the whole Hugh Jackson thing. So I, I guess my answer is I think if the Eagles were not interested in Ben and they had – and then Hugh Jackson, you know, blows them – you know, takes the Browns job – Maybe they would have had a second interview for several, you know, maybe you know, Mike Smith may, would have gotten a second interview, maybe Marone. But I do think that I always felt coming in and the best chance was that Mackey would be the head coach. And I, I kind of feel that way. I think eventually they, they kind of maybe subconsciously wanted to land on Ben. Um, but you know, I think it's a great question. You know, de- the Eagles definitely sped up the process. But if everything had played out the way they thought, I think Ben would have been the head coach. He just would have been named, you know, 
we're taping this on a Wednesday. Maybe he maybe he would have been named on Tuesday. Right, and that that I think that's a question probably the Giants fans at this point uh, aren't too concerned about because he's no. the coach now, and and the Eagles didn't grab him, but it certainly probably changed the timeline if nothing else. Now I will say this: I, I corresponded with a source that was that's uh, that Wednesday that he was hired, mm-hmm. and as of Wednesday, like morningish afternoon, I heard the candidates were Mike Smith and Ben McAdoo. And then that same source got back to me later in the day and said, well, Ben McAdoo is going to be their guy. So the idea that it was Ben McAdoo and Mike Smith, I just don't – once it got down to that, obviously, you know, Doug Marone wasn't in the mix. Uh, I don't think Terrell Austin was ever in the mix. And really, who else were they going to get at that point? Hugh Jackson was gone. So those were kind of the three guys. It was Marone, McAdoo, and uh, Mike Smith. They had sort of weeded out Marone, it appears. And, uh, you know – what was really going to change the fact that between Mike Smith and Ben McAdoo, I think in the end they probably would have came to that decision regardless. Mm-hmm. Now, now the Giants here obviously went through a process and they interviewed people like you were just mentioning, Jordan, some of the candidates. They went through, a, you know, this wasn't one candidate, just McAdoo, and then hire him. They went through the process to kind of gauge what else was out there. But during that press conference, John Merritt talked about, you know, watching Ben McAdoo operate in practice for the past couple of years and watching the way he coaches and the way he handled his offense as a coach, you know, right in front of him. How long do you think or do you believe that John Mara kind of had an inkling here, maybe from when they brought him in or at some point along Mara, um, McAdoo's two years under Tom, that he would be the next guy? Let's go to James on this one next because I got that feeling from Mara that he kind of thought this was going to be his guy, you know, prior to Tom exiting. You know, that's, I, you know, obviously I wasn't on the beat when, when Ben came, but it's, you know, and reading stories from back then, it seems like the minute Ben showed up, people sort of tried to, you know, put two and two together. Um, you know, John has said in the past, that, you know, he didn't really know who Ben was until Ben came here. Um, maybe I could see John going into this process thinking, you know, it would really be great if, if Ben McAdoo, you know, knocks our socks off and comes in and he's the best candidate and we hire him. I don't think John necessarily started the process saying, "All right, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna go through the motion, and I'm gonna hire Ben." I think Ben had to go out and earn the job, um, but but I, I so I don't think they just handed it to him. But at the same time, I'm sure they thought, well, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing if he wins this job. And that makes sense that he's going to have to go out there and, and give you a good interview and, and confirm the things maybe you saw for the last couple of years. Jordan, how about you? You were there both years covering the Giants. You've been with them both years of Ben McAdoo as a coordinator. Did you get the feeling that, that Mara was kind of alluding to that, that he was very impressed with the two years, and that, that added to the interview process, that he had this base of knowledge and, and he liked him as a coach before he even sat down with him to think about him as a head coach? I think there was definitely doubts from when I, you know, I've spoken to people in and around the organization. There was definitely doubts. I don't think this was a slam dunk. As, as the way, you know, it's going to be portrayed now in no way, shape, or form. And look, sure, they might have liked this guy when they brought him in, um, you know, what, two years ago? But Jerry Reese said he basically had – he didn't hear of him until that – until they started searching for the offensive coordinator two years ago. They had never really heard of Ben Mackin. So it's not like they said, oh, they pinpointed this guy. You know, John Myers said he had never met him before he was hired. You know, he met him after Tom Coughlin made that hire. They were big, they're big on letting their coaches hire their own staff. So I don't think this was anywhere near like, a, okay, this is our head coach in waiting. Look, this is a guy who had never called plays in his life. They weren't going to say, this is definitely, you know, this is the guy we're going to hire to be offensive coordinator because he's our future head coach. He came from Green Bay where he was the quarterback's coach for Aaron Rodgers. Okay, you know, I think a lot of guys can look good in that spot. He had never called a play. He had never been a head coach really at any level. So, I don't think it was as much a slam dunk as this is our coach. And even when the process started, uh, you know, I had people tell me that there's, there was people that weren't sure, people in the Giants organization or that really that weren't sure that he was completely ready for this at this point. And I think in an ideal world, the Giants would have liked for him to have been a coordinator for another year or two and then made him the head coach. But the way it all turned out, they said, okay, we have a guy here. We know what he brings to the table. We like him. Are we really going to let him walk and go take that Eagles job and maybe sit here with regret two years later? And what are they going to do at that point? Hire Mike Smith or Doug Marone? Right. That would have felt like, you know, that wouldn't have felt right for the Giants, especially if McAdoo landed in, in the division 
uh, with the Eagles here. Now, Jordan, if he was about to have a second interview. He was likely going to get that Eagles job. So, yeah. I mean, what, what are you going to do when that happens? You, yeah. What would whatever, what would be saying right now if Mike Smith or Doug Marone were the coach and Ben McAdoo, who we don't know if he's going to be a great coach. We have really have no nobody really knows. But if he's sitting there, you say, well, why didn't we take that up? We why didn't we take that chance? And, and it's not like college where you know we like you, Ben. So go coach at Stony Brook, and if you win ten games, we'll bring you back and give you a lot of money in two years. Like if if McAdoo walks out the door, he's getting he's a never coming job. back. Yeah, he's getting he's getting an NFL job. He's never coming back. And I think right. John had to take that into account when he made his decision. Exactly. He, that was your one chance to get him if you wanted to keep him, and they did. And now he is the head coach of the Giants. They know it's a risk. You know, they know it's, it's a risk. risk. Yes. As are most head coaching hires, this one, this one will just be expedited here because uh, he's now replacing a guy that was, you know, a tremendous coach for them. So there's going to be that. And he doesn't even have the experience. I mean, you know, he did, we just never, no one's ever seen him in this spot. Right. And, and now he'll get that chance and his staff will play a big role in how he does from the jump. Now, Jordan, you started by saying that the surprise or just kind of the concern over bringing back Steve Spagnuolo. Now, the Eagles have been interested in him. There was that report coming out over the weekend that the Eagles, with Doug Peterson now as their head coach, maybe wanted to bring in Spagnuolo as their defensive coordinator. They've moved on from that. The Giants apparently said no. They didn't want to give him permission. They didn't have to. Uh, but what about Spagnuolo? Just independent of, of the staff being maybe too similar to last year. Now, you guys got a chance to watch Spagnuolo this year. Obviously, they don't have much talent to work with on defense. But – He's presided over some bad defenses the last few years, his last couple stops, and he obviously did a good job with the Giants way back in the day when they won a Super Bowl, 2007. What about him? Do you, do you feel he's a good defensive coordinator after watching him up close? Is it hard to tell? Jordan, how do you feel about Spags moving forward here? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm, uh, I, I need to see. You know what I mean? I need to see tangible evidence. When's the last time this guy ran a, a quality defense? A while ago now. 2008. I mean, yeah. You know, that's eight years ago. I, I got I to gotta see it. I mean, last year, I mean, somebody you know, tweeted at me today something like, oh, I think Spagnuolo did as good, you know, a good job with that defense. And I'm thinking to myself, well, fine, but you know, how much worse can they could have been? Could, can, could they have been? I mean, they allowed almost 300 yards a game passing and were dead less in the league. I, they, I get it. They created turnovers. But uh, you know, there were some things that make me – a little weary. I, I think the fact that they could never forget solve, but even put a band aid on the fact that they were getting just hammered in the middle of the field by running backs and tight ends. That is one thing that really gives me pause. I get the lack of talent. There certainly was a lack of talent. There was a lack of pass rush the whole first half of the year. Uh, they lost Prince for a while too. On top of everything else, they didn't have a safety. I get it, but. I still have. I, I still need to see it before I'm convinced of anything. When you look at the numbers, and, and then James, want to get your thoughts on Spags too. When we get, you look at the numbers. I mean, 2007, 2008 with the Giants, they finished seventh and fifth overall in defense. And then since then, uh, as the head coach of the Rams, obviously head coach, not just defensive corner, but head coach of the Rams for three years, he finished 29th, 19th, 22nd, and his last two stops as defensive coordinator, Saints and Giants, dead last. So. I mean, you could look at that as talent. You could look at it as when he had Human Yura and Strahan and, and Tuck. He finished seventh and fifth, and he doesn't have those guys, and his defenses are bad. James, your thoughts on Spags as, as now they move forward still with him as a defensive coordinator now for McAdoo? You know, when we were talking about, you know, when the Giants were in the process of hiring a head coach, people kept on saying, you know, John Mayer wants to get a guy who's you know, got ties to the Giants, and he, he's got a chip on his shoulder. He has something to prove. I mean... <laughs> Steve Spagnuolo has a lot to prove too, so I think you know maybe the same logic Absolutely. kind of kind of applies to defensive coordinator. I mean, look, the Giants were really really bad on defense this year. I don't think I need to. I don't think I'm breaking any news. Um, and Spags has had a rough run. The stats are not kind to him in, in, in his past few defenses. But if you look at it this way, the Giants had a major talent issues on defense this year. And look, they're not going to they're not going to get themselves a top five caliber unit in one off season. It's not going to happen, but if they can go in and get Spagnuolo some players, you know, get them a true free safety, maybe get them a linebacker, get them some pass rush help, you know, either bring Prince back or get another corner. And, you know, I think basically the, the ceiling next year is okay. Spags, you're 32nd. Can we get this thing to 16th? 
because they get this thing to 16th. We, we talked about this coming into this season. <laughs> That's what I'm, they, I'm this about to say. Middle it's of the fun. road. This is exactly that, what we said this year. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, like, all right. <laughs> yeah, the mediocrity. The mediocrity. That's all they need. And, you know, <laughs> look, Spag, Spagnol and McAdoo worked well together. They have a good working relationship. But, you know, I, when, when Tom stepped down, I actually did a radio interview for some station in St. Louis. And they just, like, they, they, their jaws were on the floor. They couldn't believe the Giants were going to interview Steve Spagnuolo for their head coaching position. And I get that, why they felt that way in St. Louis. I mean, obviously, they have bigger fish to fry now. But he's, he just is looked at differently by the Giants. It's just, that's his place, you know, that people look at, think of him in a different way. And I think that he's got something to prove. So you like the guy, you trust the guy. You might as well see, get, get him a couple of players and see if he can turn his thing around. That's the way I look at well, it. That's know, why I think I, their logic is. I always say that, that when you have a head coach and he spent his whole life, you know, running offenses and being an offensive coach, you know, Ben McAdoo's not going to go in there and be go in there and tell the defensive coordinator whoever it is that he had, a guy who's obviously spent most of his life coaching defense and knows probably a hundred thousand times more about defense than Ben McAdoo. That you know, he Ben McAdoo's not kind of gotten uh, any first year coach isn't going to be able to go in there and do it. And you know, this is my past experiences. I was in Philadelphia. Andy Reid came in, very similar background to Ben McAdoo, except he didn't have those two years as as coordinator. Came as the Packers Green Bay, uh, the Packers quarterbacks coach. Came in, and I said that the most important hire you have when you're in a situation like that is the defensive coordinator that you hire. Andy Reid hired Jim Johnson absolutely struck gold. He didn't have to go. He basically had a defensive head coach on his roster. Ben McAdoo's defensive head coach is now Steve Spagnola. He put a lot of trust in Steve Spagnola, and we have questions about him. So it makes me a little, weir- a little leery about the situation. And he, Ben McAdoo's fate is essentially, especially early in this tenure, is going to depend on how good a coach uh, Steve Spagnola is and how well he's able to run and really – uh, I don't know, make all make the key decisions with McAdoo in his ear about that defense. It's a great point. And, and the Eagles actually, in another way, gave the Giants an out on this too and gave McAdoo an out to maybe think about a different coordinator because they wanted the opportunity to talk to Spagnuolo. They wanted to put their old band back together in Philadelphia. But, I mean, that to me just confirmed the belief the Giants still have in Spagnuolo. And McAdoo has that he wants him as the guy you just talked about, Jordan, because... They could have allowed the Eagles to talk to Spagnuolo if they wanted to, but they didn't want him to go. So now he's going to be the guy here. And, and I think you bring up a good point that uh, it's going to be on him to run that defense well because, I mean, McAdoo also, and something we can get into, he's going to call his own plays, which means, I mean, like you said, the defense is going to have to be run basically totally by Spagnolo. Yeah, and, I mean, that, and you, look, look, we saw – look who the – Defensive coordinator. I mean, I, I've talked about this a little bit on Twitter. The defensive coordinator for the Eagles is, is Jim Schwartz. It's a pretty good guy that they settled for him. A guy yeah. who's had a, a lot of success. And you wonder, you say, you know, hey, that, that would have been a pretty good guy to bring in at the same time. Is the flip side, the downside of that is Jim Schwartz, if you go and he runs and he gets this defense up to 16th, 12th, 14th, maybe even 10th, Jim Schwartz was going to be up for another head coaching job. And then you might have to re- go and reset again. So. You know, maybe yeah. that maybe that plays into the, the situation, and, and and the people at the top of the Giants' food chain think very highly of Steve Spagnuolo, which obviously played into it. They make suggestions; they don't force coaches on anybody, but they certainly give their opinion and make their suggestions. Meaning John Maris, Steve Tisch, Jerry Reese. So then Ben McAdoo is basically his decision to say, "I want this guy." I mean, I think the way that Ben approached it and and Doug Peterson approached it. I mean, I I, I can see the reasoning behind both. It would, with Peterson, it kind of reminds me of when Steve Spurrier got the Redskins job and he basically they gave all this money to Marvin Lewis, got him away from the Ravens, to basically, like, okay, you go take this half of the team and do whatever you want. Um, and you sort of get to feeling that some extent that's what's going to happen in Philly. But I, I also think that, you know, I think Spags is a guy, and Jordan and I know, Jordan knows as well, I think he's going to be able to support Ben, you know, and not, you know, necessarily, you know, you know, was if, if Eagles offense struggles and Schwartz's defense is great. You know, people would say, why isn't this guy the head coach? You know, I don't think that situation is going to happen here with, with Spags and McAdoo. It probably won't. And if it doesn't, that's, that's obviously, you know, that's what the Giants, the Giants are hoping for the best case scenario possible with these two um, working together and now filling out this Giants staff. Now, 
there's a lot of questions moving forward about what the Giants are going to look like, what kind of talent they'll have, how they'll spend the draft. All that kind of stuff is coming up. But um, you guys wrote an interesting piece this week. I, honestly, I forget which one he wrote. I read it. Um, but about the Giants at spending and the Packer way. And, um, you know, they have a lot of money coming up at Capri. We'll go to James on this that was one James, first. Yeah. That James, was me, yeah. I, that's right. You wrote it. Um, if it's it was smart, good, if it's smart, it's James. It was a good yeah. piece, a smart piece. How about that? I hadn't thought about it until you wrote it. Now, obviously, where McAdoo came from, the Packers, they don't spend much in free agency. They do a lot of developing, and, and they're great at it and have been great at it for a long time. The Giants have, as we know, a good amount of money coming off the books this year, and there's been, uh, there's been a thought they're going to spend big. How about marrying those two things? I mean, do you think maybe we should pump the brakes on them spending a lot? Or you know, where are you with that as, as we look forward to what they're going to look like? Yeah, you know, like I wrote this, I don't think some, you know, maybe people, some, maybe some people on Twitter understand is that the Giants are not at at a point with their roster due to their, you know, draft issues in the past, and you know, obviously they hope that those issues are in the past. There for the next couple of years, like they're going to have to use free agency. I think the way the Packers do business is a way the Giants maybe are tending. Maybe that's something they're aspiring to, but especially this off season. They're going to have to spend some of that money. Um, I don't know if they're going to, you know, bring in major big name free agents. I mean, I think a lot of Giants fans seem to think like, you know, they're going to wake up in mid March and you know, uh, Muhammad Wilkerson, Alshon Jeffrey, and Eric Berry are all going to be at a press conference putting on, you know, Giants hats. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to happen. I do think they're going to spend money, but you might see them try to spend it smart. You know, try to augment certain positions and also use the draft. There's but I different think, ways to spend money. You yeah. know, you're not going to go get the thirty-year-old, uh, you know, top pass rusher. You, you know, that stuff like that. You know, I think that that's sort of the difference here. Yeah, and the Giants also have to figure out what they want to do. Yeah, everybody talks about JPP and Prince, but Robert Ayers, you got to make a decision on. You know, I mean, you know, they had the number, you know, they had the number two ranked special teams and those special team rankings. Jordan wrote about. Well, the long snapper, the kicker, and the punter are all free agents too. So you got to get those guys. You got to draft guys. So I mean, the money it all kind of gets eaten. You know, you have to make decisions on Cruz, Schwartz, Beatty, so Beeson. So all the money kind of it, it, it adds up pretty quickly. I just think that they're maybe not going to make the big splash the big sexy name, but I think they're going to have to slowly build through free agency to get to the point where they could become a draft first operation. I think they will go with, uh, you know, they will get a big, big sexy name, yeah. maybe one or two defensive playmakers, but they're going to be selective. Like they're not, they're going to go get guys that are still, that are good for them now and the future. Like, you know, this is a three, four, they're going to get younger guys. They're, they're, this isn't, they're not at the point where they're going to go. They're not the Broncos of the last couple of years. The Broncos have been all in. You know, they had yeah. Peyton Manning at the end of his career, and they were totally all in. I know the Giants have Eli, but they're not going to be totally all in like the Denver Broncos. Where would they bring it? Evan Mathis, uh, Emmanuel Sanders, TJ Ward, DeMarcus, DeMarcus Ware. Ware right? Like, these aren't the kind of guys the Giants are going to go out and, and load up their roster with DeMarcus Ware type guys, uh, you know, Evan Mathis type guys. It's just, that's just not where they're at right now. That's not the, what McAdoo was talking about, that's not what he believes in. But there are different ways to spend money. For instance, there will be some guys that will be available for contract extensions. This is something I'll, I'll, pro, I'll attack and write about in the coming days. Justin Pugh, Jonathan Hankins, those are guys whose contracts can be extended. Those are two guys that are a big part of this team's future. So there's Building, there, building there, block. Yes. There's different ways for them to go about spending that money. Of course they're going to spend a lot of that money. This is the NFL. There's a salary cap. But at the same time, they're not going to, you know, lock it up in guys who are, you know, have a two or two year window right now, or you know, a two three year window like uh, the, at the end of their career. That okay, they can help them. We're going to get this team up. We're going to get it over the top. I just don't see that as being it. Maybe one or two huge, not huge, but one or two big difference making defensive players. I think that's an absolute mandatory thing. They need some sort of playmaker on defense, uh, and and they're kind of backed into a spot where they have to get that and. They're going to have to try and get that in free agency. So whether that's a safety, whether that's a pass rusher, whether that's a linebacker, those are all three spots that must be addressed. Taking care of some of their own, I think, is something they're going to do. And then obviously, you know, correcting some of the the mistakes and the contracts that need to be addressed. The, uh, the BDs, the crews, maybe Schwartz. So those Schwartz, you know, his contract was already reduced last year. So either they want him at the price that he's at yeah. right now, which it really isn't that much. No, it's or, not. You know, or Rashad Jennings, guys like that, you know, 
hey, this is what they are. They're not that expensive. But do we want to go forward with these guys? Are we and with Schwartz, it's probably most mostly uh, health. Can they, do they think his foot's going to hold up? His ankle, his leg is going to hold up or not? Because really, he's not worked that much. He's not you know he's not costing that much money, especially if the, if he could be a starting guard. So they just have to make that decision health wise. Right, they just have to make sure that he he could play and he could be a guy for them. They put on the line there. What have you guys thought about his staff so far, James? I know you had a video on his for on Ma- mm-hmm. McAdoo's first week. Um, Spagnuolo is obviously the biggest one because that's his defensive coordinator, almost you know, almost like an associate head coach, considering he'll be all of everything on that side of the ball. But in in total, what have you thought about the staff he's put together? Any theme you've noticed? I mean, obviously it's it's going to be a little different than Tom, even though two of Coughlin's you know biggest names, McAdoo and Spagnuolo, head this thing up. Thoughts yeah. on his staff so far of the names we've heard and who they're bringing in? No, I, I think he's done a good you know. So far, so good. I mean, not all the names are known yet. Um, the one thing I will say is a lot of people have been saying, you know, well, you know, as you get try to get Packer guys, you know, the, the Packers are kind of protective of their staff. And, you know, Packer coaches, you know, like Matt, like Ben did, they, they kind of move up the ranks in Green Bay. And if they can get a, a much, you know, big promotion elsewhere, they go. So I, I don't think necessarily that you're going to see – all these guys who who Ben worked with in Green Bay all, all of a sudden show up. Um, you even heard I've even you've even heard about how there's like a yeah. sort of an unwritten agreement for those Packer coaches when they go out on their own. You know, you, you can't, can't, can't go can't go litter their staff afterwards. So, um, you know, I thought the the hire Adam Henry w- was interesting, and obviously the fact that he coached Odell Beckham Jr. at LSU is going to grab a lot of attention. But he's a guy with a lot of experience. You know, he's basically was uh you know he was kind of a a roster you know a, a training camp body that you know couldn't you know had a couple whacks with the saints in training camp never could make the roster and he basically walked off the training camp and became an assistant coach at McNeese McNeese state his alma mater so he's been coaching for a while now he's had a lot of you know nfl experience college experience so he's an intriguing guy um i think you know and one of the things that i think speaks about ben is he's shown a lot of confidence in his staff. You know, Spagnol interviewed for the job that Ben got, and he kept him as defensive coordinator. Mike Sullivan, everyone thought, was going to be the offensive coordinator two years ago when Ben got the job. It looks like he's now going to become the offensive coordinator. So he doesn't seem to have any issues with uh, with surrounding himself with, you know, older, maybe more experienced guys that, you know, he, he's been competing with for jobs in the past. I still think, you know, it's to be determined. We'll see how this goes. I mean, there's, they have a lot of the staff to fill out. Let's see the kind of shape that it takes. I think it, you need a mix of young and old, uh, you know, experience, especially on that defensive side, sort of maybe guys that work and know what Spagnuolo likes on the defensive side, guys who know um, what he's looking for. Uh, it, it just makes a more – less disjointed staff if you have guys that are all doing different things and have to learn you know the coordinators kind of ways i think it makes it harder so if you have guys that have are in the the west coast background that have been worked in the green Bay system or uh you know there's a lot of variations to that those west coast style systems it'll create more synergy with the giants offense and working with ben mcadoo so i'd expect a lot of those guys to have connections to either mcadoo mike mccarthy uh, New Orleans type, uh, you know, runs a similar offense. Guys who have experience in that kind of offense will, will probably be good position coaches to work with McAdoo. So before we wrap this episode up and kind of, you know, look forward to an offseason, which now could begin for the Giants, from each of you, what's the biggest question you have on your mind about the Giants now moving forward? McAdoo's in place. They've replaced Tom Coughlin. The staff is coming together. You know who the quarterback is. So those kind of big, big questions some teams have. The Giants don't have. But from each of you, what's kind of the question on your mind for the next few weeks, next couple of months? James? For me is, you know, one, what can the Giants do in this offseason? What can they get done in free agency and in the draft? And, you know, long term, you know, I don't know. how. I think Jordan's on the same page. I don't think the Giants, yeah, the Giants were 6-10 and 10 and they lost a bunch of close games. But I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that, you know, they're, they're you know, Ten plays away from being twelve and four. Um, no, I still think they have a ways to go. And what I'm intrigued to see is, okay, so let's say that you know we're sitting here next year and the Giants went seven and nine. How you know how does McAdoo handle that? How does the fan base handle that? The fact that you know 
they, you know, just because they change the head coach doesn't mean they're going to be back in the playoffs next season. Um, you know, Jordan at the beginning said, you know, Ben, you know, evolution, that revolution, all his sayings, you know, that stuff sounds great, but you know, if there are no results, you know, that stuff can almost turn against a guy like Ben McAdoo. It, it can almost become a, a punchline, you know, if there's not success. So that's my biggest question is how, you know, how would the Giants as an organization and a fan base handle the idea that, you know, Ben might come in and there might be all these changes and they still might be on the outside looking in with a you know mediocre to losing record for the year. Yeah, I mean, that's why I say when people ask me, I don't think Jerry Reese is sitting there on the hot seat and he's going to get fired after this year. This is this is sort of a reload. I mean, this is, you know, the, the, when they when they signed on with Ben McAdoo, they signed on kind of for, okay, we're going to go with a little – you know, re, re uh, not rebuild is not the right word. Like a, a reload of a restock, a sort of reset of okay. Now we have a three year period, a three year stretch. Let's move for a two or three year stretch. Let's try and rebuild from here and get back to where we need to be. That doesn't mean they expect to be six and ten or four and twelve next year. I think they at least expect to be you know a, a much better team, an eight and eight type team. So you want to see growth, and if not, people are going to be calling for Jerry Reese's job for sure. But for me. Look, this is a process. The first step in the process is, okay, we're going to hear some draft stuff because the senior bowl is coming up, the combine is coming up. After the combine, then we have free agency. So to me, the next step, we're talking about rebuilding the roster, how they do it. That's what everybody wants to know now. What players are they going to bring in that are difference makers? But first, I think the next step of what we're going to hear is, okay, which players are going to be addressed internally first? That means... What's going to happen with Victor Cruz? What's going to happen with Will Beatty, John Beeson, Jeff Schwartz, those guys? What are the Giants going to do in that regard? So that's what I would look out for. And then after that, then we're going to get into the free agency part. And then you get, what do they do with Robert Ayers, JPP, Prince, Josh Brown, uh, players like that. So even Jasper Brinkley, a guy who was a, a pretty decent contributor at middle linebacker this year. Granted, you don't want him to be your starting middle linebacker. But he might be a good contingency plan as your number two little middle linebacker after you address that. So these are the questions I think that are most uh, that are most important to Giants fans now is how are they going to rebuild this roster and what's this roster going to look like next year? Just when we get big answers, we get new questions coming at us, and that's what we'll talk about this offseason. Just a little programming note here: uh, we're probably not going to do this podcast every single week on the same day the way we would during would do during the season, but just make sure to follow us on iTunes, follow us on Stitcher. Whenever a new episode comes out, we will have it. We'll tweet it out, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I know with the offseason coming, news comes in at different times. So we'll probably reconvene at different points of different weeks to, to give you a, a new episode. We'll try to go weekly, though. We can right. We, you know, we'll, I mean, if it's, right, if it's like a Tuesday one week and then a Thursday the next week, we're, we'll keep coming at you probably almost on a weekly basis. But uh, probably a little different than during the season when we had all those you know games to react to and all that stuff. But and next we're not week, going next anywhere. Week, next week we got a Senior Bowl. That's right, James. The week, the week after yep. that, the week after that, uh, we have soup. We have Super Bowl. So and then a couple weeks later we'll have Combine. So those are all weeks that'll be big weeks coming up. Definitely, always a lot to talk about, and, and we appreciate all of you listening and being with us, Jordan. As always, thanks for doing this. Anytime, Joe. Appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, James. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening to episode 40 of Talk is Cheap. The Giants have a coach, and now they go out and try to build a roster to win with. We'll talk about it and a lot more coming up over the course of the offseason right here on NJ.com. <laughs>